Pentecost. I love it. I appreciate it. Amen. It's changed my life to the better. And uh, this world has left us up, left me high and dry many times. But the kingdom of God has also always been faithful. God's always been faithful to me. Amen. Colossians chapter 3 this morning. Good to see the visitors. God bless you. Glad that you're here. And uh, just looking forward to getting to know you better. And uh, Colossians chapter 3. And if you'll just turn there. And we'll just try to obey God again this morning. And uh, I know this morning, last Sunday morning, I preached a message on Christ is all. And I never got through a full text there. But tonight we're going to pick up, and today, excuse me, we're going to pick up and try to finish what I feel God has put in my spirit for the church. I know this is a message to every individual, but it's a message to the church. I feel God has just laid in my heart and just looking forward how God's going to use this in your life if we will let Him. Amen. Colossians chapter 3. And if you're there, just give me a good amen. Amen. Colossians 3 and 10. We'll pick up there. Last week we read from verses 1 on and came on down to verse 8, I mean, excuse me, verse 9. And we'll pick up today and we'll go preach from 10 to 14 and just kind of conclude this if God will allow us. Colossians 3 and 10 says this. And have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian or see it then, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Amen. How many of forgiveness is important? Amen. And above all these things, Put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. 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 How do you like to say it? Amen. Today I'm going to preach you with God's help on leaving the grave clothes and putting on the grace clothes. Leaving the grave clothes and putting on the grace clothes. If you remember last week, let me review for those that were not here. Last week I inserted, and we began to preach last week, on Christ is all. And I, I, I said that when we read those words and we say those words, that Christ is all. How many can say that and really mean it? Come on now. You've got to mean that when you say it. And I tried to reiterate to you just last week, before you are anything, you are a Christian. Before you are a student, you are a Christian. Before you are a, a, somebody that works on your job, you are a Christian. Before you are a mom or a dad, you are a Christian. Before you are anything else, first and foremost, you've got to relate and you've got to put on the glasses and focus through these lens that Christ is all. You've got to live there. You cannot put that on on Sunday and, dis- and divorce it on Monday. Christ has got to be all every day of the week, every moment of your life. If we're planning on seeking the Lord and doing His will, you've got to understand Christ is all. My friend, you've got to make Him everything. You've got to make Him, you've got to let the cup be full, and you've got to let it be running over. Christ has to be all. And I gave you three points last week, and we're going to move into our message today. Last week I gave you three points. First, the Bible says in Colossians, to seek those things which are above. And then He says, set your affections on things that are above. And then He says, mortify your members, and I said, you've got to slay those things that are within the body. Last week I said this, my last point, first I said, seek, I said, set, and then I said, slay, and my friend, the Bible says, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, and cleanseness, and order and affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, but now you also put off these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy, communication out of your mouth, lie not to one another. Last week I told you, with the help of God, after you seek those things that are above, after you set your affections on those things that are above, you've got to put to death the members of this body. You've got to slay the dragon. You can no longer let self live in your life. The day that you let self take an inch, he will always try to take a mile. You've got to keep under subjection that body, that mind, that spirit. And my friend, you've got to slay those things. And today, if you will allow me, just for a few moments, I want you to picture this. As, as Paul here does, he presents to us two different people. He shows us the old man in his wardrobe, and then he shows us the new man in his wardrobe. I want a picture like last week. You've got to take off the old man, and you must put on the new. 
Amen. I want you to picture this. My mind went to this in prayer. Can you imagine what it was like? We know the story in John chapter 11. We know there when Jesus goes and He calls Lazarus out of the tomb. He says, Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible says when Lazarus came forth out of the tomb, it says he was bound with those grave clothes and he had a napkin over his face there. My friends, I want you to understand this today. I want to compare grave clothes to the old life that you live. When Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb, He said this, He said, loose him and let him go. He was saying, you've got to get rid of them old clothes. You've got to get rid of the old life, my friend. Hear me today, friend. One of the positions in the job of the church, and even as a pastor, we've got to help people that come to church. They may come out of the tomb, but some of them still need to get out of the grave clothes. Some of them still need to lay down the old life and the old habits and the old mindset. My friend, you've got to leave the grave clothes, and you've got to go to the wardrobe and the things of God that He has prepared for you. Now, I just picture this in my mind. Help, help me here. Just bear with me. When Lazarus came out of the tomb, the Bible says there was a napkin that was over his face. Where do you think was the first place of the, his body that they uncovered? I don't know about you. I just picture him taking off the mat and the napkin off his face. I mean, he may be like this, but I don't want to do his feet first. He can't see nothing. You know what, church? You know what we got to start at first and foremost when we're trying to work with new converts? you got to make sure they can see. Come on. you got to make sure that they can see. you got to make sure that they have example. you got to make sure that they understand. You say, Brother Derek, how does that happen? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Thank God for preachers. Thank God for teachers. Thank God for the preach Word. My friend, once again, we've got to understand this. We've got to put off the old wardrobe. We've got to take away the anger and the wrath and the malice and the blasphemy and the filthy communication and the lies in this age. We've got to understand that has to be put off before you can put on the new man. You ever put on clothes on top of clothes? You ever done that? Well, we used to play years ago. I used to play paintball. Anybody ever heard that? The older generation may not have a clue what I'm talking about. But paintball is what it is. It's devices now. They have a gun and you have a, it's pushed out by, I think it's CO2, one of those gas devices there. And you put paintballs in it and you turn it up and the paintballs come out going at rapid speed. And my friend, it's left bruises on my body before when I had three layers of clothes on. It's left bruises that stayed with me for over a year. You say, hey, man, it just gives you a little bit of adrenaline rush. Teenagers love it. I kind of got out of it, amen. I'm not much for it anymore. But understand this, my friend. Before I would go out there and play any paintball, I I would put in a man if it was a hundred degrees. I would, some people go out there with t-shirts on. I would have a t-shirt. I would have a long sleeve shirt. I would have a hoodie. I would have a coat because I layered on layer of layer. I'm telling you, my friends. Hey, this is what ends up happening in Christianity sometimes. Some people never lay off the grave clothes and they're trying to put on the new clothes. I'm telling you, my friend, it's going to do nothing but frustrate you. It's going to do nothing but just find you in constant conflict, my friend. I could never get comfortable with Three pieces of clothing on top of each other. I feel for us, them holiness women. They got a layer and everything else. Amen. I know us men can just kind of just put t-shirt and shirt on, and that's it. Holiness folks got a layer and try to keep everything modest. Bless the Lord. Amen. Amen. We do believe in keeping it holy and modest. Amen. So we lift and listen to me today, my friend. We've got to make sure we're laying off the old man. Three times Paul admonishes us. Hear me. Three times he admonishes us. He says, put on, put on, and put on. And he's talking about here, I'm going to call these today, not grave clothes, but I'm going to call these the grace clothes. I'm just, just what I'm going to label them. He was saying, it's not enough just to take off the old man, but you've got to put on the new man. My friend, sometimes you can specialize in the house of God. Some people are good at laying things aside. Some things are good at putting this to the side. But my friend, I'm not. I, I'm, I'm happy that you understand that. But how much have you put on? How much have you put on when you walk with God? I like what the Bible says. Tarry in Jerusalem until you're endued with power. It means to be clothed in power. It's good taking it off. But have you put on the things of the Spirit? We need to put on the gifts again. We need to put on the fruits again. The church needs to be clothed like it should be, once again in beauty. But in context here, let's stay the context. In Colossians 3 and 10 it says this, And having put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of God. Notice this, he calls it a new man. He doesn't call it a reconstructed man. How many knows when you got born again, 
God didn't take your life and put band-aids on it. God took your life. He put it in the grave with Christ. And you resurrected now with Christ Jesus. All things have passed away. Things will now become new. Thank God the resurrection power and being born again is being made new in the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody loves that. Get a do-over in life. Think about it. You get to become brand new in Jesus Christ. It's no longer Derek, Derek Jones that is living. It is now Christ. It's no longer my will, but it is His. It's His. It's no longer my desires, but it is His desires. We might all have to put on that new man. We have to make sure we're putting it on. We have to make sure it's there. Notice this. It says renewed in the knowledge after Him that created Him. I like what Paul says in 2 Corinthians. He says the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. It and it's something this old morning, this old, this old physical man is dying off. It's getting older. It will be able to become decrepit and old. But that spiritual man can live and live and live. It's being renewed every single day. My grandmother, when she was in the hospital years ago in a nursing home, and her mind was starting to go. I, I, I read this verse one day and it just her name came right to my mind. She couldn't remember who I was. But boy, she knew Jesus. <laughs> I loved it. Hey, Grandma, how you doing? And she just looked off and I said, you know, and then you get singing the old hymnal and you see that old hole in his hand get to shaking with Parkinson's and she'd raise it and she'd say, she would say Jesus and she'd begin to maybe talk about Scripture and I thought to myself, my Lord, it is amazing how this physical man, one day she'll have a new body, one day I understand all that, that resurrection, that rapture one day when the grave has to release her, no longer she'll be able to know and understand those my friend and that spiritual man that she had. It was being renewed day by day. Notice this, when we put on the new man and we understand it's renewed day by day, it says this, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, born nor free, but Christ is all in all. There's a few points I want to make today. When you put on this new man, you understand this, in Christ, God has abolished all differences of country. How many is happy to be in America? We got, we got, we actually in this church, we're blessed. We got people that's been all over. But you know, in Christ, it doesn't matter where you from, you're from. I'm in Christ. What's your nationality? Christ is all. <laughs> Where you plan on going? Christ is all. Everything is Christ. In Christ, God abolished all difference of country. There is neither Greek nor Jew. You would have to understand this. In the Jewish world, in the Jewish mind, you were either a Gentile or you were a Jew. There was nothing else to it. And there was no way around that. But when Jesus Christ came, and Paul is saying here, he said, now it's more than Jew and Gentile. Forget that. Now it's Christ. Christ is all. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter how tall you are, Christ is all. He abolished country. But then notice this, in Christ, God has abolished all difference of creed. There's neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. The Jews couldn't look at the Gentiles and say, look, you have to do everything we're doing. Christ is all. You understand today that if you're born again and you're in Christ, it is a, it's a beauty. That is your creed. Then you are a Christian. That should be your creed every single day. Not only that, but in Christ, Christ has abolished all differences of culture. There is neither barbarian or Scythian. In Christ, all culture differences are abolished. Now when you say, what culture are you from? You say, Christ. We don't preach that much anymore. My friend, I heard people preach on God. I heard people preach on the Holy Ghost. Once again, we need all of it, but we need to preach Christ. Because He is the image of God. He is the express image of God. He was the Holy Ghost, came from Him, from the Father, lived in Him, and now is given to us. My friend, not only has He abolished all differences of culture there, now Christians have their own culture, they have their own pride, their own creed, their own country. But God has also abolished all differences of class. I love this. It doesn't matter if you have two dimes rubbed together, or if you're a millionaire sitting somewhere in Christ is all that matters. I read one writer, he says this, there's no class, there's neither bond nor free, rich or poor, slave or master, intellectual or somebody that's not smart. A common salvation reduces everyone to the same exact level. All of us at one time were sinners who came to Jesus.
Jesus. And now all we can say is this. Christ Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Christ, the Savior, the Son of God. He puts us all on a level playing field that makes no room for racism, no room for hate, no room for bitterness, no room for anything. Christ is all. I'm going to say it till we get it. Christ is all. I've had people come up to me before and say, what creed are you? Christ. I don't. It's Jesus. We're whole in this church. We're independent. We're Pentecostal. Yes, all of that, but number one, Jesus. We're Christ-centered. Christ must be all. Get this today, my friend. Just like when Christ, when He gets rid of our co- He makes us a part of one country. Christ makes us a part of one creed. He makes us a part of one culture. He makes us a part of one class. My friend, just like Onesimus and Philemon, they're in the Bible. They're on the same level. The, the master and the slave is on the same level. Christ is all. Christ is my country. Christ is my creed. Christ is my culture. And Christ is my class. If you don't understand anything, just understand this. Christ is all. Now let me preach a message to you. Now that we are introduced, Paul gave us a picture of the old man and his clothes. Now here's the old man, and his clothes are fornication and and, and anger and malice and evil concupiscence. Here's the old man and his clothes. All right, here's his garment right here. This is the old man's garment. It's fornication. It's filthy. It's rotten. It's it's, it's anger. It's malice. All these different things. But then he shows us the new man, and he shows us the new man's wardrobe. The new man in the Bible, hear me today, my friend. This is what we've got to understand. He says, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved. You said, Brother Derek, why should I put on this new man? Even though I'm saved, I want you to understand this today. More than being saved, as long as being saved, you've got to make sure you're adorning yourself with the things of God. And you've got to put on the things that He wants you to put on. You said, Brother Derek, what is the reason that I should put them on? I, it feels good to be forgiven. Why should I go any further? Let me give you four different reasons that Paul gives us here. Number one is this in verse 12. God chose you. I know we like to think better of ourselves. Now look, I don't believe in predestination and Calvinism and all that. But I do know this. I didn't come to Jesus on my own merits. That Holy Ghost stirred my heart up. I didn't come to the altar just because I got bored one day. I know there's a decision. I know there's a free will. But I'm telling you the day that I came to an altar, I felt the love of God pulling me. I felt the cords of love pulling me. I'm telling you my friend, the reason that you're to put all this on, and the reason that you're to live holy as a living sacrifice for Christ, number one is this, God chose you. He chose you. When I was little, you know, I, I always was a chubby little fella. As a little boy, I wore huskies. Anybody remember what huskies are? <laughs> Bugle boy huskies. thought I was tough stuff too, buddy. I would go to youth camp. And I'd stand in line, who wants to play volleyball? We're all like, we want to play. You know, it felt good when somebody fought. Sometimes I was last. <laughs> felt good when somebody said, you broke that cup. You bring our team. I'm like, Me? Me? I get to be on your team. Can I serve first? <laughs> no, you just stand over here. <laughs> but it feels good to be chosen. I'm telling you, friend, if you're looking for significance, if you're looking for joy, if you're looking for happiness in this world, I can tell you, I'll tell you, more than the president calling your name, more than a movie star, God forbid, calling your name, I'm telling you, my friend, there's something about when God called your name. There's something about when He chose you. There's something about when He wanted you to come. There's something about He wants you on His team. He wants you in His kingdom. That is the beauty of this. God wants me. Oh, Uncle Sam, you know that, that picture? Uncle Sam wants you. And that thing is real long, you know. You! You may tell me what I'm talking about. He wants you! I'm telling you more than Uncle Sam wants you. God wanted you. Oh, Holy Ghost, help us. Some of you need to understand that today. I feel in my spirit you need to understand this. You say, oh, Brother Derek, you don't know. I'm telling you, God knows. And God called you, and God has dealt with you, and God has convicted you, knowing full well who you were, and what you were, and what you did. Sometimes we say, with God only, God knows! 
If God knew, He would. God knows when He said He loves you, when He called you, He knew what you were bound by. He knew the pit of despair you were in. He knew the sins you were involved in. Yet He still said, Come unto me, all of you that are weary and heavy laden. Come unto me, those that thirst. I'm telling you, my friend, Jesus chose us even from the very foundations. God wanted a people. God wanted somebody that was going to serve them. So He chose us, number one. If you don't feel motivated to put this garment on spiritually by the time we end, there's something wrong with you. Number one, God chose us. Number two, God has set us apart. <laughs> I don't know if I'll get over this today, but let's listen. Can you imagine what it was like to be in Egypt in the book of Exodus there when the angel of death was passing through that tenth plague? Could you imagine what it was like when we would be there and you had to apply the Lamb's blood there on the doors? But I like what God said to Moses. He said, this night, He said, I am going to show a difference between Israel and Egypt. There's going to be a difference. My friend, not only has God chose us, but when you get saved, God has set you apart, my friend. That is the beauty of this. He has put that form the alone of God. He says we're holy. We're set apart. And that's the beauty of serving the Lord. You ought to be different. Amen. You go to the mall and you blend right in in style and attitude and all that. God help you. Because I've seen some of the creatures walking around there. It's scary. I mean, it's like a cave of darkness sometimes. I'm like, I told my wife, I said, I, I said, because if you're like me, men say amen. My wife will get shopping, and I, and I only go when she wants me to. You know, it's just a little time. We'll go get a little bit of Japanese food there in the food court and all that. And I, I'll go down there and sit on the back. And finally, I'm walking around with her. I said, sweetie, I'm going to sit down. I can't, you know, I, you know, you looked at the same thing four times. If you're not going to get it, I, I said, whatever, put it on credit. But I'm just kidding. <laughs> just do something. I'll go out there and I'll sit in that little wait now. I'll sit there. I'm like, oh my gracious. If that was my daughter, ain't no way she'd be walking around here alone like that. Then you see some guys are at the bottom of the pet, chains and piercings and spike dyed hair. I'm like, man. And then all of a sudden, big old pants legs. they got to take two steps to move the pants. And it's, I mean, it's like they're dragging their pants behind them when they're walking and chains and piercings and bolts and... and Holes that big? I'm like, whoa! It's like the abyss you read of in Revelations. It's like, what is this? My friend, I'm telling you, God chose you, but God also set you apart. Right. Hallelujah. That's the beauty of holiness. You say, well, do I have to? Quit asking if you have to. And say, it's a privilege to be set apart. Yeah. Hallelujah. I love it being different from this world. Why do I want to relate to those that are going to hell? Why do I want to relate to those that God's judgment is against? My God, let me relate with the saints of God. Let me relate with Jesus. Because my friend, they killed him, but he got off. And one day, I get to be with him in his likeness, in his image. That's the beauty of being saved. He chose me, but he set me apart. Quit worrying about fitting in down here. Well, they pick on me. So what? Good. You had the last laugh. When they're divorced at 20 years old and they're drunk. I've got more friends now that are either dead or drug addicts or drunk driving and all these things. And when I was in college, when I was in high school and Lord, far from college, bless the Lord. You know, never even thought about it. It didn't cross my mind. Now, now I thought about it. I said, I wish I did something. But anyhow, just going to preach till I die. But I, my friend, in high school, you worry about peer pressure and say, look, what if they, what are they, who cares? I look at them now, here I am, I'm blessed. Got a wonderful church family, got a wife, got a baby. And even get to make a car payment, bless the Lord. God's good to me. And but I look at them, and I, I'll go back home sometimes, it's not my favorite thing to do, but we'll go downtown to a little coffee shop and I'll see somebody, I'm like, hey, how you doing? They're like, oh. Got five children, you know, been divorced too. I'm like, my friend, you're only 30 years old. What happened? Oh, he just wanted to fit in, you know. Why do you want to fit in down here? You know, in high school, we had what was called the in crowd, you know. It's when people were on the in crowd, you know, high school, you know what I'm talking about. It's people that are on the inside. But thank God for the heavenly in crowd. <laughs> There's a different in crowd that I'm a part of now. 
And it's not a part of that, but it's in here. It's in the kingdom of God. So I'm warning women and men, be careful how much you pamper that flesh and what it look like the world, my friend, because that body will deteriorate. That body will let you down. But that spiritual man, he chose us. He set us apart. But he gives us in verse 12. Not only did he choose us and set us apart, but he loves us. Whew. He don't just have to tolerate us. Does it? <laughs> It's all right to be angry and sin not. You ever had anybody in your family that you like them and you love them, but you just don't want to go on vacation with them? <laughs> anybody? Is it just me? I got a few family members. I love them to death for a few days. And I still love them. I, I, tell, I tell my wife, let's get in the vehicle. Let's get out of Dodge. I tell you, I've got to have a break. I've got to pray through. I've got to get on out of here. We've got to get on... But God don't just love you at distance. Hallelujah. God doesn't just forbear you occasionally. Derek again, let's put up with it. No, God loves you. <laughs> he chose you. He sets you apart. But God also loves being with you. He loves it when you pray. He loves it when you sing. He loves to hear you sing. Even if it's bad, He still loves it. God loves me. You ever heard that? Only a father or a mother could love them. I feel that way with my Heavenly Father at times. I know He loves me. But He loves me with only a love that He has. And you know how we get along as saints? We'll talk about it in a moment when we put on the new robe. We love each other because He first loved us. And He put up with us, so we put up with each other. Amen. So there it is. And God will make it a, please, a pleasing thing. Not only did He chose us, not only did He set us apart, not only does He love us, but guess what? He's also forgiven us. Let's look at these new garments that God has given us. He says this, Now that we're chosen by God, we're set apart by God, we're loved by God, we're forgiven by God, all of this adds up and we can sum it all up. The only thing we could say it is by God's grace that all of this ever happened to us. I mean, think about it. I'm chosen, I'm set apart, I'm loved, I'm forgiven. The least you could do is look to heaven and say, God, what can I do for you? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. God looks back at you and says, I love you, I chose you, I set you apart. Put this on. I've got some things, my son. I've got some things, my daughter. I want you to put on and I want you to live. And the reason I'm doing this is because I love you. But if you really love me back, you'll do this for me. Do you know why we give our tithes and offering? Because I love the Lord. I don't feel like this every time. Oh, preacher, preacher, I'll give, okay. I do that because I love them. You know why we live the way we do in overcoming life? And we strive to. If you don't, please get on board. I'm telling you, it's because He loves us. Notice this. The things He tells us to put on, number one. He says this, put on the bowels of mercy or tender mercies. This word, his word here, bowels of mercies, is the Greek use of the term bowels of compassion because from the Greek, the people, the people of that time located the deeper emotions in the intestinal area. And when somebody said that they had compassion on them, they actually felt something move them. You ever seen something before that actually stirred you up your insides? Maybe a tragedy. I'll tell you what happened to me one time. I, I've seen something happen to a family. I forgot exactly. It wasn't a family. Excuse me. But you hear things happen of somebody getting molested. And when I hear about it, I, I just didn't feel it. But I felt it. And it was like I said, oh, Lord, show mercy. I'm telling you, church, once again, we better put on the tender mercies of Christ. My friend, we, 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 we don't, sometimes I don't think we comprehend how much compassion Jesus really had. Sometimes we have compassion as long as it is in our yard or in our arena. But as soon as He gets out of our family and our arena, all of a sudden we say, well, that's not my family. I'm not too worried about it. Tender mercies, my friend, is what we must put on. As believers, we need to display the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not something we turn on and off like it's a radio, but it's something that we live in. Sometimes we have compassion as soon as we see or, you know, a missionary come and say something. We'll say, oh, I have compassion, Lord, help. You ought to live in that mindset. You ought to have compassion every single day. 
My friends, hear me. Every single day, you ought to have compassion. You ought to be moved to do the things for the kingdom of God. Every time you see a homeless man, you ought to have a burden. Every time you hear something that's come at me in the world, you ought to have a burden. Not only do you put on the tender mercies, but he says this, put on kindness. Let me tell you some of the meanest people I've ever met before, I'm going to be honest with you. I've met some mean people in the world. You ever met somebody mean in church? Am I the only one? I know it should You say, well, Derek, that shouldn't be. I know that. <laughs> I know it shouldn't be. It should, shouldn't be a lot of things. But I've met some of the meanest people in church. And you're not here. I love you all. <laughs> and if you're a mean, I don't know about it. We'll find out eventually. Amen. I hope you ain't. But I mean, I, I've been someplace before. I told my wife. We went and preached somewhere. And I know this is going on the internet. But it was somewhere in the state of confusion. I'm telling you, I've never been tra- treated so mean in my life. I left there feeling like I preached. And after I preached, I gave it all. I fasted. I prayed. And I delivered my heart. I felt the anointing. And at the end, the preacher said, Well, you did your best, son. Have a good old day. I told my wife and I left there. I said, I ain't never preaching there again unless God tells me. I said, He's the meanest man I've ever met in my life. My friend, put on Kindness. Look, the holiness movement has been branded this way, and it's wrong. But I'm telling you, there's been some people in holiness that have been mean over the years. And I've heard people say, well, and I know some people just don't want to live for the Lord. But I've heard some people say, well, I don't go to holiness because there's some mean people in there. And I say, well, I've met a few too. But Jesus is very nice. you met Him? I promise you, for every mean person I've ever met in holiness, I've met 50 very nice and wonderful Christian folks. For every mean person, every mean old devil that poked his head up, I'm telling you, God's always given us a Gabriel. God's always given us a Timothy. God's always given us a something that'll come through with a message of encouragement. My friend, you've got to put on kindness. When you get saved, you ought to be kind one to another. You ever seen somebody walk around like they're sucking on lemons all the time? Just You think you see faces out there. You ought to get up here for about 30 minutes. We'll make an hour this morning. I'm, just, I'm playing with you. But as we look at this today, my friend, we look at this. We've got to put on kindness. We've got to live in that mindset of kindness. Now that we've got to put on the humbleness of man. The pagan world, Paul's day, did not admire humility. They thought it was something that was horrible, something that was pathetic. But when you get saved, guess what? You better put on humility and not false humility. <laughs> you ever heard of false humility? Well, they'll say something. They really want you to say amen to it. And they really say, you know, say, well, I know I didn't preach good today. And somebody say, well, no, yes, you did. They just wanted to hear that in the first place. If you didn't want to preach good, put it in your pocket and go home with it and pray through. There's a reason. Amen. Oh, I put on humbleness of mind. You ought to be humble. A prideful mindset will tear down a church. It will tear down an individual. Pride made a devil into, I mean, made an angel into a devil. That's what pride will do to you. So learn to be humble of mind. And my friends, you've got to live on that every single day. Also, my friend, put on meekness. You know what meekness is? It's basically meekness is the word that was used to describe something that's just when power is under control. Meekness, when I studied the word, was described as a soothing wind or a healing medicine or a cold that had been broken. In each instance, there is power. If the wind is out of control, it becomes a storm. If the medicine is out of control, it can kill. If a horse can break loose, it can cause damage. But what if that is under control? I was telling the Sunday school class this morning, Jesus... One of the most powerful and most meek men walked this earth. He said, I could call 12 legions of angels and destroy this world. But now, nah, I think I'll just go to Calvary. That's what meekness is. Sometimes in this world, in America, we think we have to get on top just to smack somebody down. No, sir. Get on the bottom. God will push you up. He'll show you the secret door. God will show you what to do. Not only do you have to put on meekness, but Lord, help us here put on long suffering. Well, he did me wrong one time. Well, 70 times 7, brother. We've got to learn to put on long suffering. That word literally means a long temper. When I got saved, there was a temper I had to deal with. And if it kept on living, I wouldn't be saved today. Hey, amen. 
Those who got married, and I understand not, when people get married, and some people are just smooth as I don't know what. When I got married, I had to learn to tame my temper. I'm nothing abusive by no means, but I had to learn to say what to say on the right time. I had to learn my wife. We had to learn to cohabit. My friend, if you're temper, don't just break. Help me here. But just because you're old, don't mean you can get mean. I've met some people that say, well, he, he's just old and grumpy. Look, these ain't the twelve dwarfs or whatever they're called. Christians don't have a grumpy. We learn to deal with it. And look, you say, don't, don't, that's just the truth. I had, a, I had family members I could take you to now that are old. I had a granddad. I, 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 can also say, I can't say this about a lot of people. I had a grandfather I never saw unjustly lose his temper. I can't say that. You can't say that probably about a lot of people. But I'll tell you what it is. You better be long-suffering. You better learn to be able to control your temper. Because if you can't control that temper, it's going to cause you a multitude of issues. And you can blame it. Well, I'm Irish. So what? Christ is all. Well, my mom and dad had a temper, so I've got to... Christ is all. When you get saved, you get a new heritage. You get a new country. You get a new mentality. You can't blame it on your parents. My disposition is just different. It may be, but Jesus will tame it. Help us, Lord. Put on forbearance. And the word literally means to hold back. To hold up. God is forbearing towards us. We ought to be forbearing towards others. You ever heard somebody say, and, they, and, they, and I hope they're not in church. I'll tell you, if I, were, if I walked in the room, I'd have beat them right up. I'd have done this and I'd have done that. That's not forbearance. Forbearance is when you say, Lord, help me. I don't know what I would do in that situation, but God, give me the strength to overcome. Help me be forbearant. I know there's a law in justice. We also, number seven, and I just a few more points, and we'll, we'll leave on. We've got to put on forgiveness. I want you to hear me right here, because, you know, you can't always so see when the wind's blowing, so it's good as quiet. You understand what forgiveness is? Forgiveness is that logical result of all that Paul is telling us about. He lets us know you have to do more than just endure somebody. You must forgive somebody. Sometimes we mistake forgiveness as saying, look, I won't get around them no more because if I do, I'm going to say something. So I'm going to leave them over there and I'll just... And then other people say, well, I'll endure that. No, what God desires to do is give you a heart that's free from all bitterness and anger. Forgive! Forgive no matter what it is, you've got to learn to forgive. Not just endure, but forgive. Because as the Bible says, Jesus forgave you. Last point today. I mean, you know, last point today. Put on number one. Last one. And number one, probably in all of them, you've got to learn to put on love. Now, we, we perverted that term in America a million times. We really don't even know what love is sometimes. If you want a picture of love... Look at Christ. Look at that word. They had to invent the agape. They had to invent the word to describe the love of God. We really have to love, we have to love one another. We once again, the most important Christian virtue. It's like the girdle that ties the garment together. It keeps it all on. It's the first fruit of the Spirit. Love is first. Then comes joy and peace and long suffering and gentleness. If you don't have love, you don't have none of it. I don't care if you speak in tongues 20 minutes a day. If you ain't got love, give your body to be burned at the stake. If you have not charity and love, it amounts nothing. Let me ask you a question. Why are you here this morning? Are you here because you love the Lord? If not, you're wrong. And you're guilty of coming to church unprepared. Are you here? What are you here for? Do you love the Lord? I'm here today because I love the Lord. But you know what, church? I hope we love each other. We've got to once again understand what love is. This is what D.L. Moody, he drew a picture, and this is just a kind of a story that D.L. Moody put together. And D.L. Moody, Moody used a picture of the Lord looking to Peter and saying, Peter, go hunt up the man who put the crown of thorns on my head and tell him that I love him. Tell him that he can have a crown in my kingdom, one without a thorn. Find the man who spit in my face and preached the gospel to him. Tell him that I forgive him and that I died to save him. Find the man that put the Spirit to my side and tell you that there's a quicker way to my heart. It's called love. Love the Lord thy God. Then love thy neighbor. And you can fulfill all the commandments.
Stand to your feet. I appreciate you listening. As my wife comes to the piano. And I, I'm mindful that we have dinner, but just want to obey God. I know this is very pastoral in preaching. I know there's different ways we preach. But I just feel in my heart today that if you do not understand the fundamentals of this gospel, church, you've got to do more. Thank God for being saved. But I feel that when I was praying, some here are content with just being forgiven, saying, Lord, I don't fornicate. Lord, I don't get too angry. Lord, I don't drink. I don't do drugs. I don't think bad thoughts. And but I'm going to ask you today, you've got to do more than just take all that off. I'm going to ask you, are you over here as a new man? And are you putting on mercy? Are you putting on love? Are you putting on long-suffering? If you're not putting them on, then the Holy Ghost is not moving in your life. Because the Holy Ghost is going to help tailor you. You ever been to a suit store? And a guy says, look, I'm going to take the measurements. I'm going to tell you. You know, God looks at us as individuals. He's going to measure you up. And He knows what you have need of. Somebody may be over here and they just got a, they're the kind of person they don't get angry. And they are long-suffering when they get saved. Some people are like that. But God may look at that person and say, well, look, you're long-suffering. You don't get angry. You don't say much, but you need compassion. So He takes out that tape measure. And He'll say, look, put this on. I believe God today in this congregation is wanting to pass out garments for us to put on. He's wanting us to put them on. Say, so Brother Derek, why should I? I'll tell you why He chose you. He separated you. He loved you. That's why you should do it. Commentator John Phillips said this, and many of you can relate if you're older. He said, when he was younger, he said, you always had one suit. He said, and that one suit was something you was called your Sunday suit. Anybody remember? I had actually had a Sunday suit. Mom and Daddy wouldn't buy me a suit every year. I had one I wore out, buddy. I'm telling you, I'd probably find it somewhere still in storage. That old Sunday suit that you'd wear. And eventually that Sunday suit, would guess what it would eventually begin to do? It would begin to get tattered. It would begin to wear out. And you would put it on, just smile when you go to church. But every now and then you find a hole in it. And then you have to replace that old suit and you have to get a brand new one. I want to tell you today, my friend... What God gave us at Calvary, what you're to put on, it never wears out. You will wear out before the suit will. <laughs> you will deteriorate in character before God's character will deteriorate. Before the suit will soil, you will soil. Before it will fade, you will fade. We are to wear this everywhere we go, my friend. We are to put on the things of God. Take off the grave clothes and put on the grace clothes. Now I want us to bow our heads. I'm just going to do what I feel led to.